Hi everyone, stand here. Can you hear me? I just want to do a little test that you can hear me, okay? No, I'm Hohenschik. It's hard to say. He knows what I'm talking about. How do you say yours? Oh, no, never mind. Um, so yeah, um, I work at Leadspace, uh, and I'm going to talk about simplifying complete data solutions. Uh, just the agenda of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to introduce myself, introduce Leadspace. I think it's important to understand what we do to explain why it's complex and uh, how we try to simplify it. The data science team, what are the modeling use cases that we have? Uh, what are the analytics that we currently show our customers? Uh, and I'll talk about a feature we're currently developing, which is called model drivers, and then just kind of general PM advice on this whole idea of simplifying the, the products. So <clears throat> a bit about me. Um, I'm from Israel. I was I served at the intelligence unit in the Israel Defense Forces uh, for three years. Uh, then I traveled a bit in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, a bit more than that. And then I went and studied a, a bachelor's of management in psychology in the Hebrew University. Uh, and then I joined Leadspace in 2013. So I've been at the startup for four and a half years already. Uh, I started as a data, data analyst, uh, which was that role is the one that actually creates the profiles for our customers. You'll get that uh, when I talk about what Leadspace does. Then I became a technical customer success manager, a lot more interaction with the customers, uh, realizing what they actually need and getting feedback on the product. Then solution architect, which means that I was matched with a CSM, with a customer success on each account, uh, providing the more kind of sophisticated side of, uh, of running uh, complex projects for the customers. And now I'm director of analytics solutions. So what I do as I serve uh, kind of, a, I call it the bridge of context. I made that up, but I like it. Uh, so I call it uh, between product, uh, our customers, and data science. Okay, so we have uh, the data science team. I'm going to talk about them. And uh, I like to snowboard, to play soccer and drums. If anyone, we can talk about that as well later. Um, a bit about Leadspace. Okay, so we're a B2B audience management platform. What the hell is that? Uh, that is a very bomb, bomb, bombastic, I don't know what, but I'll explain. It, it comes with uh, three different solutions. The solution is blue, in blue is the one I'm in charge of. I'm actually in charge of these two, but the solution in blue is the one we're going to talk about today. It's the most complex one, uh, and it's the one that uh, we're trying. We have these challenges of simplifying. So the idea is that customers usually start by uh, purchasing audience data management. What that does, uh, we actually integrate with uh, Salesforce, Marketo, uh, if you know those kind of um, uh, systems uh, for marketing and sales, uh, and we create, a, we take care of data hygiene, we make sure that the, the data is uh, full, it's segmented, and things like that, um, which helps route the, the leads to sales and marketing to, do, to be more effective. Then what happens with our customer? They're saying, okay, the lead space data is pretty good, it's really good, it's actually better than the competitors, why not model based on that? Right, because if you have good data, you can model better. You have better uh, data to model on. So we kind of came up with this audience modeling a couple of years ago, where we actually create predictive scores for customers on the lead and on the account level. There are other things we do as well. We do persona fit, so we actually tell you is that person the one you really need to talk to, and which content you should send to that person. And we provide the insights, which is the main uh, part of what we're going to talk about. And then they say, okay, so you cleaned our data, you have good data. You created models based on that good data. Now give me net new people that I should go after based on those models. So the model tells me, here's an A lead, give me all A leads. Here's an A account, give me all A accounts. So it's kind of a, a flow that goes for, for most customers. It's like a land and expand. We land here and we expand all the way uh, to the bottom. Uh, so before I move on, I kind of just want to understand uh, uh, here who works with uh, marketing people or sales people. Okay. Um, anyone here is a product manager? Okay, some aspiring product managers, I'm assuming. Cool. Uh, weird question. Do you think your, how many people here think your, uh, solution and product is complex? Okay, most. And do you think you're doing a good job simplifying it? There, okay, good, good. I like that comment. The, the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, so, uh, if I say anything that is very specific to marketing or sales that you don't know, just ask. Because I'm used to the terminology, so sometimes I think things are a bit, uh, um, uh, I, I kind of know the, the terms, but most people just, they never encountered those terms. Um, okay, so data science at Leadspace. There are four members. We have a head of data science in Israel, two, uh, two uh, that work under him in Israel, and one in San Francisco, just moved here, is actually sitting at the back. Um, and the responsibilities are, for the data science team is, this is the overall responsibility. Own the audience modeling solution end-to-end, -end, which doesn't mean much by itself. 
But the idea is that anything related to the predictive models, the insights, it all comes down to this team to manage, both from the customer facing side, which is me, I kind of work with the team on the more contextual side with the customers, and they actually de develop and produce the models. Okay, so develop and produce and refresh the models. Most of our models are propensity for an action to happen. I'll explain in a second what that means. But we also do some other things like uh, advanced classifiers, which uh, we have a customer that asked us to help them understand if an inbound lead that comes in, if they come from a marketing agency or not, just based on their social profile, uh, which is not a simple task. Uh, you have to come up with a yes, no answer, quality versus quantity, all those different things that come to play. Uh, we have another one of like, is this lead valid? So then you have to look at the contact details. Are they valid? Is it Mickey Mouse at uh, Google.com? You know that's fake. All these different things. So we work on those as well. We create the supporting analytics, very important part of it, and we continuously improve the lead space products. So we have our team kind of working on all different core lead space products uh, to just improve them with data science, which everything can uh, improve from that. Um, the modeling use cases that we have. So we we have inbound, outbound, and analytics. I'll explain what that means. Inbound is, from a marketing perspective, is scoring anything that comes inbound to my website, to my systems. Okay, so if you fill out a form that shows up in the company's uh, Marketo, my, any marketing automation system, and then they, that is called an inbound lead. And then what do you do with it? Is it a good lead? Do I pass it directly to sales? Is it a, is it a bad lead? Do I try to ignore it as much as I can? That, uh, that depends. Outbound, uh, that means that I uh, you know, proactively reach out to companies. Um, so the people here that are into marketing, you know what ABM is, account-based marketing. This is the whole new era of ABM that you really understand who are the accounts you want to talk to and then proactively reach out to them. You don't wait for them to come to your website and fill out a form. And analytics as a use case, that's a question mark, to be honest. Uh, we are not sure yet if analytics as analytics is a valid has valid value proposition from our business. Like, can we actually sell analytics by themselves? Which is a question that we can talk about. And the idea is that we create multiple uh, model versions. We have a person score, which is that persona fit of telling you how you can personalize your marketing sales efforts or find the right people if you're going outbound. Um, what we mostly focus on are these two in the middle. The first one is the lead score. You can see it's a person and company. So we, uh, what we do here in the inbound scenario is that we kind of calculate the propensity of a lead to convert to a certain action. So it depends on what the model is fed with, but it can be convert from a marketing qualified lead to a deal or from an inquiry, just someone that made it to the website to a marketing qualified lead. All of these are supported by our infrastructure and we just need to uh, work with the customer understanding what they're actually trying to optimize. Okay. Uh, company score, it's similar to the lead score, but it focuses only on the company. That comes uh, with the whole ABM era of, let's just, uh, just give me a clean score, is that company worth going after? And I'll find how to reach that company. Okay, that's, that's both for inbound, to tell you who, is, who you should send to sales because they are the right account, or to find things that you have in your database saying, okay, Leadspace is saying, this is an A account, you should probably talk to them, make sure you have your, the, your best sales rep on and, and calling them all the time. Uh, and we have a company lookalike list. That's a pretty different algorithm. Uh, don't, no need to get into that at the moment, but we can talk about that later. Uh, so the analytics. So all of this hard work that we do, we create these models in different ver uh, ways, and we have all this machine learning and all the buzzwords you always hear about big data and stuff like that. It all results in a score. Usually it's zero to, to, to 100, right? So we do all of this work. Don't try to understand this. This is from Google. It's not us. Uh, we do all this uh, complicated work. And what it comes down to, and you don't have to see it from there, just one field in your CRM that says company score with a number, okay? And that is frustrating because you're saying, well, all this hard work goes into that number. How do I explain what I did? How do I show them? How do I make them trust it? That's a, that's a, a problem. So what are the current analytics that we show? And I'm going to show you a couple of, of, of slides of what we currently show. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to ask you what's missing, right? There's something that is missing in what we present at the moment that we are working on. That is the whole uh, discussion. So I'll go over this kind of quickly. What we show is a model performance. Uh, we show on the x-axis the predictive score from 5 to 100. It's a bit cut off. Uh, and then we show you how, what is the lift relative to the conversion of each score. So essentially that means that if a, a lead gets a score of 95, 
they're expected to convert 2.2 times better than the average, right? So they can know that, first of all, the line is pretty, uh, the, the slope is pretty good. So you can see that every score, basically, is better than the one uh, before it. And you know what to expect when someone gets a different uh, than in a score. But it's, it's an aggregate, right? So you're saying all the ones that we're going to get at B, it's cut off, everyone that's going to get a B, is going to convert 1.4 times better than the average, okay? Then we show them, you know what, we'll, we'll open the, the box. We don't want it to be black box. We want to show you the different signals that go into the model that, that make the score. So you're seeing like different uh, signal types, like company size, revenue, industry, there's technologies, there's a lot of different signals. The actual signal, so if it's company industry, it's going to be financial services. How, what is the incidence in your data? Just so you know kind of uh, how many we're talking about out of the whole population. And then the lift, anything in green means it's convert, it converts better than average. Anything in red means it converts less than average. Okay? That is still not enough. We're saying, okay, this is just one dimension. Like if, if you look at this here, financial services, 10% of the data, very long green bar. And, and manufacturing, 6% red bar. You, if you just look at this, you're going to say, oh, financial services I'm selling well to. Let's just sell more to financial services and let's avoid selling to manufacturing. But that's not true because just by combining two dimensions, you already get a much, much clearer picture. So what you're seeing here is the industries on the left, a bit cut off, sorry about that, uh, and company size here, number of employees. And then you remember I said financial services was the greenest one, was the best one. You see that it is green for the, for the high company sizes, but it's actually red for the low company sizes. So essentially what that tells me is that if I, if I only had this slide, I would say financial services is great. But essentially it's only great 250 or above. And manufacturing, the, it's a similar story. So manufacturing is, can't find it right now. I think it's this somewhere. So all of them were red and then there was one green at the end. Oh, there it is. Here it is. Okay, manufacturing. So all of them are red, but there is a green dot at the 10K to 50K. So there is some sweet spot in manufacturing, and the model will pick that up. The model knows that manufacturing by itself is a negative, but manufacturing with a large company is a positive. Right? And we show this to customers just to make them understand how complex this is. This is just two dimensions, and we already had a like, full story to talk about. Uh, if you start introducing revenue and technologies and social sources, all of these different things will come into play here, and there's so many ifs that a person just can't do it. That's why you use an algorithm to tell you, here's that number. But again, that number is, is kind of, uh, it's, uh, it, it's hard for us to just provide that number, so we show you what goes um, under that. So you can see that different companies in different scenarios um, reach different conversion, and this is just a scatter plot we show just to kind of show you all the different signals that go, and you kind of uh, choose specific signals that are either green or red, just to give you a sense of uh, what, what converts and what doesn't. Okay? We show some other stuff, but this is kind of the, the, the gist of it. And my question is, what do you think is missing? And what, what are they selling? Well, you have a customer who's using your tool, right? Yeah. They want to use the tool to sell a product. Yeah. Penetrating some industry, but with what? Like, what are you selling? What would you say you're selling? Okay, so. Of that means something different for your customers. Yeah, so, so for that, the, the thing is with uh, each data we model for each customer anyway, so they know that the data that we model for them is their own company data. So all of this analytics will be for that company's data based on the product that they sell. So, so, so the sales team knows what they're selling and know, they know that it's tailored to what they're selling. Okay. Yeah. Feedback from the customer on the success of how your specific uh, application has helped them meet their metrics. Yeah. One of one of the things. So uh, that is a challenge. Uh, we we can talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about it later. But the idea is that yes, we we need the closed loop, right? The whole idea. We create one model. We have this whole model performance. And the idea is that we want to see what converts, and we want to feed the the model uh, from you. We do do that. The problem is that uh, we, are, we rely on the customers to provide us with that data, and we're actually working now on a solution that will be able to kind of uh, uh, take that data as it closes and feed the model automatically. Anything else that's missing? Yeah. Can you predict what will be the cost of acquisition? In, in what way? Yeah. Depending on the company profile, if, it, if it, I provide you my, my infrastructure or my costs, will you be able to tell me in that? In the, using all your model, what the cost of acquisition for each customer will be? Yeah, so, so the, 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 
question was, is can, uh, can our models tell you what the cost of acquisition will be? Uh, yes, we can, we can essentially digest any data that you give to us and use it in the model. So we have a lot of customers that use, not, not necessarily, we don't see too much of the cost of acquisition uh, on the top of the funnel. We see more at the bottom of the funnel of what actual revenue ended up coming from these customers. And we have models that actually model on not just is that company going to buy, but is it going to buy for more than X? Or is it going to have a lifetime value of more than $50,000? So essentially, we can take any field uh, and, and digest it into the model and make it affect the scores and the threshold that we choose for A, B, C, and D. Okay, so one of the things that's missing um, is record level insights. Okay, so all of the things I showed, all of these different slides, they all show aggregate information. They don't tell me what is the story of that specifically that got that 90 or 50. Uh, and we see, we've seen that this is a problem, uh, and then that is why we are generating this uh, feature called model drivers. By the way, terrible name, it's an internal name, and we wanna, I'm actually looking for help here naming it in a better way, uh, just so that you know. Um, so from a model driver's perspective, what we mean when we say model drivers is that we want to show the most significant signals, I'll explain what categories, types, and features mean, that influence a specific predictive score on a record-by-record -record basis. Okay, so when I talk about uh, categories, types, and features, a category is uh, firmographic data, uh, it is demographic data, it is uh, technologies, it is te uh, web presence, it's all these different things um, uh, that, that you can use as attributes as, uh, as categories. Under firmographic, you will have industry, size, revenue. Those are the types. So the type is company industry, company size. And the feature is under company industry, it will be software and internet. Okay, so we go from this is the most granular to the most generic. In the way of things we want to show the customer, this is what affects the score. Okay, so this is what we're doing, model drivers, and this is the example I'm actually going to walk you through for the rest of this session of how we're developing it. It really is, we are developing it in, the, in this next month. So everything I'm going to show you are things that we are thinking about right now. Okay. Um, so when we talk about what we're trying to solve, so salespeople don't understand the scores and therefore don't adopt them. Okay. That is a problem. Uh, and we understand why it's a problem. We show them all the analytics, but eventually it's one score there. Salespeople don't have patience whatsoever. And if they see a multiple couple of scores that they don't understand, they're going to say, what the hell is this? I'm ignoring it. Okay, that is, th that is a problem on the customer side. It's obviously a problem on our side as well. Uh, why solve it? So sales metrics are just not improving, right? Someone paid for lead space to come in, create a, uh, uh, a scoring model, score all the leads, and wanna, they want to see improvement in results. And it's not happening because they are not using the scores because they don't trust it. It's a whole, all of this is happening. And marketing, who usually pays for this, aren't showing ROI because everything that I just said, all right? Um, so what are we doing? So one of the things we're doing is we're developing this model drivers feature where we explain more to the sales team and hopefully we, we, we expect the adoption to increase and all of these to be fulfilled. Okay? Uh, so milkshakes. Uh, I have actually a, a good story about milkshakes. It's not my story. It was, uh, did anyone here attend Product Con? Uh, your, you have, of course. Uh, it's your conference. Uh, but. <laughs> That makes sense. Um, but uh, I think it was the product manager for Dropbox that shared this story at ProductCon uh, of uh, this guy uh, that was hired uh, by this milkshake store to help make increase customer satisfaction and increase sales. And then he had a very creative approach of instead of just going and say, oh, just add strawberry banana or add some sort of, uh, of flavor, he went it from, from a very creative direction. He kind of tried to understand who are the customers. Uh, and he created two cohorts of, of, of customers, two kind of groups uh, that he identified that one of them were people that are driving to work and one of them were parents. Uh, and the people that drive to work, they, he asked, what do you like about this, about this milkshake? Um, what is the purpose, the use case of that milkshake? And, and what they said is, uh, I, I drink it while I'm on my way to work. Uh, and for the parents, they're like, why do you buy this milkshake? Uh, to please my kids. Okay. And then he thought about, he went to the, to the drivers and he, and he comes to them and he's like, if I create a smaller straw, so I don't change anything about the milkshake, I change the straw, it will take longer to, to, for people to finish it, they will be happy. And that worked. And for the kid, for the parents, he's like, okay, the parents, the kids is, the kid is crying, I want milkshake, I want milkshake, but you don't want him to get a giant milkshake, so you're going to give him a small milkshake. So 
what he, what he actually did in the product, he changed the, the straw to be smaller and the sizes to be smaller, which makes, which is very different than the way you would think when you're hiring someone to increase customer satisfaction. This has probably nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I just like this story. Uh, but, but I hopefully I'm going to be able to connect it. Uh, so the customer problem from going back to our world, not milkshakes, um, for salespeople, this is a happy salesperson. Uh, so what do most people, salespeople care about? Money, uh, selling, yes. What else? These are all definitions of selling from the dictionary. That's all they care about, on average, oh, most. I'm not gonna talk about all sales rep. But essentially they want to sell more. That's what they care about. So I'm, I'm really, I'm simplifying this on purpose in the way that what do they really need? Information that will help them sell. They don't need me to brag about my, my product. They don't need something too complicated or too sophisticated. They need information that will help them sell. Even further than that, they need information that will help them feel confident that they can sell. Okay, uh, marketing. So what do more, most marketing people care about? Leads, well, creating a healthy pipeline for sale. Uh, hitting marketing KPIs, right? And then what do they care about implicitly? That is kind of my view of the world, uh, but I think it is true. Not getting yelled at by sales. They really care about that because they get yelled at by sales and most of the times they don't real, real, they with our product at the current situation, they can't defend themselves. A salesperson comes, why is this a 90? I don't know. I know that this combination of industry and size creates a high lift. And the sales rep will be like, what the hell is this? Uh, and getting promoted, to be honest. Uh, okay, this is kind of why I chose this. Uh, so what do they really need? Need, and not, not again, simplifying it completely. Information that will make the sales team happy. Will make them yell at them less and information that will make them look good, okay? So when you think about it this way, uh, in a more like, instead of thinking about from a product perspective, but more from the pain point and the use case that they have, uh, then it, it, it makes you think more creatively and differently about the problem you're actually facing. Um, so I wanna talk about what, and I'm, I'm, we talked about the why and, and the what and the, and the how. I wanna talk about the how a bit deeper. Uh, so I kinda separated it to the PM owned how, and to the dev and data science owned how, okay? So when I'm talking about what PM owns on the how side, it is how do I solve the customer problem? That is the question I'm asking. Uh, and it's not an easy thing, right? When we come back to model drivers, because the way machine learning score is generated is not straightforward, and the way it's generated is very different than what they used to. I separated it out to two bullet points for a reason. It is kind of the same thing, but you need to think differently when you think about these two things, because one thing, it's not straightforward, how do I make it easy? And for this second bullet point, it's not what they're used to, is how do I create this like change management for them? Because sales and marketing people, what they're used to, they're used to uh, uh, five points for downloaded white paper and seven points for filled out of form. This is not how machine learning works. It's not like, oh, industry is five points and uh, size is nine points. It doesn't work that way. So you have to understand that you, that is what they think about when they hear about a score. Okay? And then things I'm currently wondering and kind of figuring out is the signal uh, considerations. So which categories, features, and signals I'm including? Because uh, again, I'm going back to what they care about. They want information that will help them sell. So I don't necessarily want to show something very advanced just to say, oh, lead space is cool. They can give me this very unique thing. Uh, I just want things that will actually help them. I have this consideration of simplicity versus truth. So uh, a funny story about this. A couple of months ago, we, we started uh, uh, working on this. And uh, one of the leads, I, I went to my data science team, like, what is the number one feature that influences the score? I don't, I want the truth, right? And the truth was a uh, machine learning company country cluster. There's no sales rep that would say, ah, okay, okay, now I know why this lead will buy. It's machine learning company country cluster, right? So that doesn't help me. It's the truth, but it doesn't help me. I can't use it. So I'm thinking about how I make it simple, but keep it pretty similar to the truth. Uh, same for variety versus truth, right? Most of the models are mainly affected by the big things, like industry, size, department, level. Uh, but I want to have more variety. I want to make it interesting. I want to show them a specific technology that the lead is using when I can, even though it might not be the one, the one thing that actually influences the score. Another thing is positive versus negative signals. Okay, so 
uh, what do they care about from a positive perspective and what do they care about from a negative perspective? I don't think they would care about that they use a certain technology that just has nothing to do with conversion. They would want the negative to be things that actually can prevent them from closing the deal. And edge cases, right? When we can't find the company. So what are we, what do we do? Okay. All these different things. Um, other things that the, PO, the PM owned how is UI considerations. So what is the wording I use? It's very important that I use kind of words that uh, sales will react well to and they will understand. Uh, I need to think where that view should live. If it's in Salesforce, is it on the accounts page? It's in the contacts page, opportunities page? Where do I put it? Uh, what is the layout of what I'm going to put? And how many signals to show? And again, edge cases of there's no information to show. Uh, so I came up with this wireframe, very, very initial wireframe of kind of thinking what I want to show. In this case, I'm showing kind of this is Google, for example. This is a predictive score. And I'm providing a sentence, pretty clear sentence. Google is 3.1x more likely to convert from account to closed one than your average. Right? This is what the salesperson wants to know. And then why? And I break it down to two different uh, uh, pieces of the, of the page. Facet breakdown, which is more kind of a holistic view of what influenced the score. Is it, was it more from a graphic or technology? These kind of things. And then the prominent predictive signals of the things that we actually want to show, which all the considerations from the previous slide are um, kind of relate to this thing. Okay. Uh, now I want to talk about what PM doesn't own, uh, but helps, helps with. So this is the dev data science owned how, at least at lead space. So how do I create the solution that the PM designed? And it's very different, right? All these different considerations, I won't go into all of them, but it's like how you generate the signals, how you extract the feature, which variables you choose, how do you integrate it, what, how do you store the data that you have? All these different things are very complex, and that is what dev and data science uh, are kind of in charge of. And I kind of added a general PM tip, which is never assume that you know this better than them. Uh, if you, that is kind of a general thing because, uh, the, I, I heard about the people that are like, uh, come to their dev and like, oh, this is just a button. Uh, why does it take two weeks? That is a perfect way to get people to hate you. Perfect <laughs> way, way. So, because you don't know what all, all the dependencies, just don't assume. Just, that's not your role. Your role is to design, to answer the, com the, the customer problem and to help them. So how do you help them instead of just make them hate you? Uh, so, what is your role? The way I see it is short feedback cycles. So um, you're, I'm the source of context for my data science team, for my dev team. I'm the one that talks to customer, to customers. I know what they want better than them. That's just the truth. So whenever they create something, we just they want. Okay, I did this little step. Tell me if I'm on the right direction. And if you and then if you do that very quickly, then you're going to save you a lot of trouble later. That they did all this work and they're oh we're changing the direction. That's actually not what the customer wants. So. I actually want to do with this little kind of uh, exercise. Uh, this is a real situation uh, of a lead that got a score of 100, okay, the highest score possible, and all of the things we're, I'm showing here are positive signals of why that lead will purchase. Okay, you can assume that this company sells IT stuff, okay, for example. So these are all different options that I got from the data science team of features that they can extract in different ways. We don't need to get into that, but different ways of extracting, uh, extracting those features. Uh, and the order matters. So if you're thinking from a sales rep, this is the order in which you will see the different feature, the di different model drivers that will, that is supposed to help you sell. Okay. So you can see we're talking about company size, industry, department, tenure at company, website technology. This is jQuery. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then there are five options. So I'll give you kind of a, a minute just to take a look at those five options, uh, and then I'll kind of ask you which one you you think will be the best. And again, your perspective is not, is it going to be complex, what to do? You're just thinking about what a sales rep would like to see, and remember the order matters. There's And by the way, there's no right, I'm actually hoping that you help me, because I need to, I need to figure it out. Option for presenting. Uh, the, the features for a certain sales rep. So a certain sales rep sees a lead that gets a score of 100, and they want to understand why they got that 100. What are the things that will lead to them converting? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so just... Uh, this is from the passage that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, these are actual signals that we take out, and we, yeah. Okay, so uh, anyone chose one? 
Okay, why? Um, I chose it because it's simple. Um, okay. Like for instance, <clears throat> as opposed to option five, it starts with sub industry, but um, in option one, it zooms out more so that, um, you know, like this more sub industry, the industry is more important to me. So okay. So, like, it, it starts off more general <clears throat> and simple. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. You, you also chose one? Yeah. You want to? Uh, yeah. I think for the similar reason that you go in a logical order, you start with the company size and the industry and then. Okay, cool. Uh, anyone choose option two? Okay, uh, option three? Yeah, why? I, I chose option three because it can tell a good story and a salesperson may want to defend themselves. Um, so if we talk about company size, everyone can find it in information. Mm -hmm. Industry is the same thing, but some industry is something deeper level. Okay, <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, option four? No takers for option four. Surprise. And option five? Most people. Uh, anyone, you, you want to say why option five? Um, well, I guess the difference between five and one being sub industry that um, the salesperson, once they establish this sort of the, the size of the company, which gives some initial indication of the ability to purchase, yeah. then it would be sort of more of the compatibility. They would want to go directly to sort of compatibility of, okay. of purchase. Okay. Anyone want to add all the five people? Yeah. Okay, uh, so my preferred one is actually five, so I'm happy that I'm the majority, and I'll explain why. It's kind of, you touched all of the, the reasons why. Uh, I'll go one by one. So with one, yes, I agree, one is, one is good. Uh, I don't like this, the website uh, technology, it's jQuery, it's so generic. Uh, it doesn't tell me anything from a sales rep. Uh, and the industry software, I actually like the fact it's e-commerce software because it has the word software, so I'm saying, well, why do I need the industry if I can go all the way to the sub-industry and I say, oh, okay, it's e-commerce software, I'm kind of answering two questions instead of one. That would be my goal. Uh, when it comes to option number two, um, you start with a technology, I don't like that, like I'm a sales rep, I, I wouldn't like, because again, they don't have too much patience, they're gonna read maybe the first three or something, uh, you're starting with the wrong thing, that would be my, no, uh, that would be my take. Uh, option three um, is, um, I don't like this, again, too generic. Uh, I would just remove it. Um, and again, you start with the technology. Option number four is good. Uh, option number four actually has company social presence medium, which is just redundant. It doesn't tell any story. It will just confuse people, and you're gonna get questions. It doesn't help. The sales rep doesn't need to know that that company has X followers on Twitter. They don't care. It doesn't help them sell. That's why it's not, more is not necessarily better. In this case, and, and five, the way I would read it out uh, from a sales rep, like, company size 10K to 50K. What does that tell me from a sales rep? They have money to buy. I can sell more. Uh, Sub-industry e-commerce, okay, cool. It's e-commerce and software. I know two things right now. The person department is their IT. I sell IT products. I'm happy that's the person I want to talk to. They're in the company for more than five years. They are probably have a uh, power to make decisions. That it all looks good. Oh, and they're looking, uh, they're, uh, they have HPE hybrid storage. I have no idea what that is, to be honest. But it just, if I'm in, if I'm selling into IT, that would probably mean something to me. Okay. And this is a simple example. And you see how complex it already gets. Just think about if the score is 50. What do you show? Three positive and three negative. What negative? What positive? Uh, and also kind of uh, uh, things like this. Industry software and sub-industry. This is redundant, right? Because this one kind of has this. Uh, and technologies that you're saying, well, I don't, I don't want this to even take any place in my database. No one cares about that. So all these uh, things uh, like uh, how the field, how much populate, how populated that field is, right? Sometimes you will see, you will see things that are just not populated. All these different things we're, we're thinking about now um, to make this a success. And you know, when you, and again, you, you think about the solution and the whole product, it's a, it's a complicated product. But we just have to simplify and make it easy to digest for sales reps and for marketing people. Uh, so what we're thinking actually is to have a story, like a, an assistant uh, in a way that uh, sales reps actually kind of get as if a, an assistant is, is sitting next to them and kind of reading out what they did from a research perspective. So if it's an A, you're going to say, okay, from a graphic attribute suggest that it's specifically industry and software and company side, it's going to be like highlighted. Also, the company uses this and that. And if it's going to be a B, it's going to give you the good things. And then you're going to say, however, and like something less good. And for C, it's going to be the opposite, but just kind of phrasing it as a sentence 
on top of that UI. So there will be this UI kind of showing you this the kind of clear thing of, of what, what's going on, and then you might also want to have a sentence just explaining to you in plain words. Um, yeah, and kind of just the last things I want to talk is general, general PM advice when you're designing these kinds of things. We've talked about all of this. So don't underestimate it. Don't ever tell your, uh, your uh, dev team it's just a button. Why does it take two weeks? Uh, and just, ex just also think about all the different things you need to, you need to work on and they need to work on. Uh, to communicate with your data science and dev teams, the more context they have, the better, right? Because they, they don't know how to answer this question. They might have a, a hunch, but they don't, they, you're talking to customers all day. You know the customer problem. You need to answer this. They just need to give you all the data and tell you what's available, what's not available. Uh, encourage fast feedback cycles, reviewing the output from a customer-centric view, and uh, never lose sight of the customer problem, right? Uh, uh, sometimes we just find ourselves, oh, there's this cool signal we can include, like company social presence. No one cares, right? Uh, people, the, the sales reps don't buy lead space. They buy a solution to their problem. So you don't need to dazzle them with all these excessive things when all they want is to sell. Again, going back to that simplicity. Uh, and focus on simplicity. Actually, went to the fifth bullet point. Um, that's what I had. Any questions? How much time did it take? Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in your um, uh, data um, finding, do you use any um, general um, uh, products such as Tableau, or is it all sort of in-house that, that you leverage? Yeah, so the question is, uh, do we use Tableau, or do we use yeah, our own analytics. Yeah, so that is a that is a qu good question. We you saw the, the visuals you saw here. Uh, sorry, whoa, have a lot of clicks. Are all Tableau? Yeah, so I'm still going back. <laughs> yeah, this is all Tableau. Uh, we did use other things uh, with the Microsoft Power BI Click. Uh, we and we're actually working now on making this. Uh, Online. So at the moment, we're still in the, in, in the situation where we send it to customers. But the idea is that we understood that there's no real, most companies, at least in our size, there's no real reason to generate your own analytics when you can purchase something here that's already fully baked and they know how to work with startups. They know, you know, if you want to OEM it and if you want to, or if you want to use it for yourself, usually we find this as a, as an easier solution. Yeah. Um, yeah, go. Yeah, uh, no, that way. Can you talk about the rest of your technology stack? Um, what, what part of the technology stack? Your workflows, your visualization, what are you using for kind of machine learning technology, data warehousing? Yeah, uh, so uh, the question is what do we use for uh, machine learning and data warehouse? I, to be honest, I don't know the data warehousing part. Uh, I know that we use SVM models uh, with proprietary additions that we added, uh, but I, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So if we go back to the options that you had, um, is the machine oh. learning um, findings um, like granular enough for you to click on, like for instance, um, obviously? There we so go. Like, I got it. If we get to option one, and yeah. like it's industry, um, is the <clears throat> is the machine learning um, algorithm like like granular enough so that if I click on it, I can go to sub industry, and then under that, like. Further granularity under you know what I'm saying, so that I can keep clicking onto any one of those and then get deeper and deeper and see yeah. what path is. Because um, if I'm a salesperson and I want to know even more detail within the sub industry, like is the algorithm like really general and zoomed out and it goes only to sub, or that will it will it zoom all the way in? To yeah, yeah. So the question I need repeat for the yeah. uh, the question is uh, is it can you zoom into these different signals or are they all Basically, the same layer. That's yeah, what you're talking yeah. about. So, no, you can. We didn't think about it, to be honest. That's a good point of kind of allowing it in real time for you to actually have this software and maybe have like this plus sign that says, but it is hierarchical, right? So, you do have software that is built above, uh, 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 industry built above sub industry and size range is built above the size exact. So, essentially, you can do that. Um, which brings a question of, do you want to allow that? Uh, cause do you want the sales rep to actually start playing with all these? Or do you want to say, okay, these are the drivers. Trust us. Again, trust us that we're doing what, that we're doing what we want, what you think is, is, is good. Uh, instead of kind of making them focus on trying to get to what they actually really want. But the, you can create it that way if you want. Yeah. yeah. So you think kind of your customer implementation, how are you handling that so you can 
front of your customers, and do you have something automated, like one fits all sort of implementation? Yeah, so the question is, do we make it uh, model custom for each customer, or do we have a, something automated? So, so the data is custom for each customer, that's obvious, right? So we, we take the data for one customer and we don't do anything for another customer. Uh, from kind of creating it at scale, uh, we do have the integration with Marketo and Salesforce, so once the model is ready, we upload it in the same way for all customers and leads start flowing and getting the scores. So most of it is, um, that is our, that is our goal too, because we want to scale this, right? And we need, and we need to have as much automation that, as we can. So we do accept of the data. We, we're thinking, how can we automate everything? We even have kind of internal tools of, okay, you get this data from, from the customer. It automatically creates the tableau, right? So all of the different reports are being created and the integrations. Most of our customers do use Salesforce and Marketo. When you start talking to customers that don't, then you kind of have this uh, customization. But I would say that, the majority of it is very standard, and we're working on standardizing it even further, except the data. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Have you considered, for instance, or have you used, like, information on the reason, the cost for, like, losing a deal in, let's say, Salesforce to, like, form models also about, like, what is the competition doing and how you're, like, losing opportunities? For, for like, what the reason for our customers of losing that? Yeah. So the question was uh, if we were using... The, the closed one or closed lost reason in Salesforce, right? Yeah. Um, so yes. So actually, whenever we scope the data that we get from the customer, we actually look at all these different stages on the opportunity. And we do multiple testing seeing, should you tag them as negative or positive? And the funny, the weird thing is most closed lost instances, we actually tag as positive. Because we're saying a company got all the way through an opportunity and then went, cl became closed lost. You know, it might be someone left the company or some legal issue or lost a competitor. They're still a good company to go after because they reached all this uh, throughout the stage. So we really test it out. So there's all these stages in Salesforce. There's custom stages. So essentially what we do, we have this way, automated way of doing it is that, okay, let's like st uh, take stages one to four as negative and stages five to seven as positive. How does that look like? Now let's look at one to three versus four to seven. So we always look at kind of thinking about Maybe the, the, all the way they got to stage four actually means that they're good or not. So we do take that into consideration. We don't take the text. We don't look at like a reason and analyze the reason. That that's not something we do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, what kind of methods do you take on in order to interact or interface with your customers? Get feedback about the product that they're looking for. Are you doing you know focus groups? Are you doing surveys? Are you going doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with them? What's that? Feedback look like for you? Yeah. Uh, so the question is how the feedback looks with the customers. Um, so we don't do user, you know, don't do surveys. We just meet with them on a regular basis. Just this morning we had a two hour, we have a two hour scoping session, which is painful, but it's important because we have all these questions we need to, to ask. And then every quarter or every six month, depending on the refresh cycle, we get new data from them. We talk with them understanding, did something in the strategy change in the last three months that we need to know about? that will affect how the data will look like, right? Uh, so we just, these are, we're a B2B company. We have 140 customers. It's not like something huge like Salesforce with 3,000. So uh, essentially we have weekly meetings with every customer that has a, a predictive model that we actually look into the trends and getting the feedback. And every, and every three months when they pull the data, we, we kind of get the, the actual uh, qual quantitative information, but the qualitative information gets added all the time. Uh, well, not all 140 of them have predictive models, but the ones that have, yeah, there's a CSM assigned to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned SDM, but um, just in generalities, like um, how many algorithms do you use? Because I know decision tree is a very popular one for um, isolating features. So mm -hmm. is it, um, is there three or four, or could you name? Like, uh, I, I, no, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is the, uh, we have, you can probably talk to Philip at the back uh, when after this, and he will be able to answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, at the back. So, uh, most of your signal come from your customers, customers, right? Uh, the sales customer, your, your, the, the end customer, right? So, what do you mean by signals? So, I guess the data points. The data points that we gather. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, the, actually, the data points that we gather 
uh, we work w with 40 data, data sources in real time. So essentially, uh, when we get a record, we ping all these 40 data sources that are third party uh, data sources they don't belong to any customer of ours and then aggregate it to find out what is the ac most accurate company size is the most accurate industry. Right. Yeah. I guess my question is, would you consider taking this, the, the data from the salesperson itself? Because I feel like sales is such a kind of a personal affair. Yeah. So like personality, you know, mm -hmm. size, knowledge, working relationship might be another set of data points. Yeah, so question is, do we use, uh, uh, do we consider using sales feedback? Definitely. Uh, but you also think about the scale of the, of the sales feedback. Uh, we mostly focus the sales feedback when we implement the model. So we actually, there's a score running and we just want to validate that it's working. So we will meet with a sales rep on the customer side and show them, oh, look, here are 20, 20 scores with companies. Does it look good or not? Okay. And they will say, oh, yes, the scores look good or not. Sometimes we even do blind tests. We have a sales rep that goes through uh, 20 records gives the score the way they see fit, and then you see how it is compared to the score. But gathering feedback from a certain sale, usually um, there's not enough meat in, in that, right? Because uh, uh, you will you will have one sales rep has like 20 accounts. If it's an someone that sells to enterprise uh, customers, uh, it's not going to be enough for you to actually use that as a feature in the model. Okay. Personality tests. Uh, could be. Could be. Yeah. That could be, so basically doing a personality test for all the sales rep in that organization and then using that as a feature in the model. Interesting. Yeah? 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 The back? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, so if you are, as, if, if you're like calibrating your models by comparing their scores versus other reps are scoring, mm -hmm. do you worry that you're just replicating rep thinking and maybe automating it, maybe making them faster, but you're not going to actually lead to a better prioritization? Yeah, so, so, uh, the, the question is if, if we're, uh, kind of afraid that we're actually just replicating what they, the rep is scoring and just doing that in an automated way. So we're using it as some feedback to, and it's, and not to influence the actual score, but more to understand the, the sentiment and things that matter to them more. So for example, uh, we can score, you, you learn from all of the data and then you score in a certain way, but then a sales rep looks at that and like, Oh, this company has less than 50 million revenue. I'm never going to talk to them. So that is insights we don't necessarily have from the data. Maybe there's all these companies that have less than 50 million that people tried to sell to. But now we understand, okay, that is a, a, a strong threshold, a strong rule that we can introduce into the model that say, okay, anything less than 50 million, they're just not going to talk to. So there's no reason to score them high. Obviously you have to, I understand what you're talking about. The fact that you have to be uh, kind of uh, careful that you're not just doing what the sales rep says, but we usually just use them as kind of a, a source of feedback to Im influence the model rather than just trying to say, oh, they think it's a 70. How can we tweak all these different things to make it a 70? Okay. Uh, you had a question, right? Yeah. I have yeah. A question. So how you measure the success of your product? Of? From the user, the no salesperson, oh. or actually, you know, the, how better, you know, help them to the sales? Uh, so how do we measure success of our products? Um, not an easy question, right? So what we do is uh, essentially when we, uh, when we get the data for the refresh, there's a couple of things we do. One, we refresh the model based on this new data, right? So we just have more data and we have closed loop for a lot of records. Plus we actually show them how the score could have, if they used it, influenced the, per the performance. We're telling them, we scored in August all these leads as A, and we told you to call A more. And now we can see that the highest conversion is for A. So if you use, if you listen to us, you just got better results. That is, that is a simple way of saying, okay, lead space tells me who to go after. I go after them and I actually sell more. Okay. So that is kind of how we, how we measure the success when, when the sales cycle completes. The problem is that we're working with enterprise company, uh, customers that have a sales cycle of 18 months. And then what do you do? Do you wait 18 months until you refresh? No. So that's when you're actually using quantitative. Uh, feedback where you're going to the sale, you're going to those sales rep and asking, do you like the scores? And you're just getting a sentiment of, uh, you know, or maybe even measuring a step, uh, a stage, uh, higher up in the funnel. You're saying, okay, I know the model predicts lead to closed one. That will take forever. So let's see how it's performing for lead to MQL. Um, that's not necessarily what the model is supposed to do. It's not necessarily going to work, right? It might, 
you might have weird logic for MQL. It's not actually going to predict lead to MQL, but it's going to predict lead, lead to closed one. Uh, so that is a challenge we are facing of how to measure it. Um, it's a good point. <laughs>